My name is Emily Berg, um, and I'm coming to you from Books and Books at the studios of Key West. Welcome to tonight's event, Climate Change and Fiction. Uh, tonight, we're bringing you a panel of three, three debut authors. Their books are each very different, but with a common theme. All three incorporate climate change and environmental issues into their fiction. Uh, so before I bring out our authors, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, there will be a chat available throughout the event. Um, but if you do have a question please, for any of the authors, please feel free to use the Q&A field, which is at the bottom of your screen. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by Coral Restoration Foundation. This amazing organization was founded in response to the widespread loss of uh, dominant coral species on Florida's coral reef. They grow and return endangered species of coral to the uh, wild to restore reef sites to a healthy state. So throughout the event, we'll be including a link to their website in the chat so you can learn more about the foundation and please consider donating to them to help continue the important work they do in the Florida Keys. So now to our authors. Angie Hockman is the author of Shift. Her professional background includes stints in law, education, and ecotourism. Julie Carrick Dalton is the author of Waiting for the Night Song. She holds a master's in literature and creative writing from Harvard Extension School. And she is also the owner and operator of an organic farm. Claire Holroyd is the author of The Effort and graphic designer living outside of Philadelphia. Please welcome all of our authors. Hi, well, thank you for having us. I'm really excited to be here uh, with Claire and Angie and to be sharing the stage. And thank you so much to Books and Books for having us. This is a, a real honor to be here. And we, uh, I think I speak for all of us that we're so grateful to all the independent booksellers that have been supporting our books. We're all debut authors and launching in a pandemic. And, and if not for these independent booksellers, we wouldn't be finding audiences. So thank you and to the Coral Restoration Foundation. Um, as Emily said, all of our books um, tackle climate change in different ways and incorporate it into the stories, but you know the Coral Restoration Foundation is also out there doing the real work. So I hope you'll consider making a donation. Though I think that Emily's going to share a link in the chat, I believe. Um, so I hope you'll consider making a donation. So um, the reason you know the three of us came together is because of that this common theme of climate change, and there's a lot of fiction emerging um, recently called climate fiction, which is a new new emerging category of fiction that doesn't have a home on a specific bookshelf or area in a library or bookstore, um, but because it's in all genres. My book is a literary thriller and Angie's is a, a rom-com and, and Claire has a science fiction novel. They're really different books, but they all engage conversations about ecosystems and, um, and it, how fragile they are and uh, what our role in protecting them is. And I think climate fiction has a role to play in how we convey climate narratives you know, more broadly. It's a way to bring conversations to people who might not go watch a documentary or maybe aren't reading the news um, about climate change and it can bring the conversation to them. And I'll give you a good example that I had, a, someone wrote a review of my book recently and they started out the, the review saying, I'm not interested in climate change. So I braced myself right there for a really scathing review of my book. But the reviewer went on to say, but, I loved the story. I loved the characters. And because I cared about the characters, by the end of the story, I found myself caring about climate change. And I think that's what climate fiction can do. It can speak to people. It's almost like a Trojan horse. If you can write a compelling story and a compelling plot and tucked away in there somewhere, some themes that you hope people will think about and you deliver it in a good story, maybe your message will get through. So I thought we would start the conversation of the three of us each maybe telling you know just a few, couple sentences about what our book is about and then just have a conversation about the way we are thinking about climate change and climate science in our books. So my book, Waiting for the Night Song, it's a literary thriller. It's primarily a story about a fierce friendship. It's about secrets and betrayal and redemption. And maybe there's something creepy buried in those woods back there. But the whole story is set against the, um, the backdrop of a changing climate in this small town in New Hampshire. Um, so I think I'll, I'll hand it off to you, Claire, if you wanna maybe tell us a little bit about your book. Sounds good. My book is uh, The Effort and it is character-driven apocalyptic science fiction. Um, a, a dark comet is spotted out by Jupiter and an international response gathers to, with the mission to build and intercept spacecraft with a one-year launch window. Um, Concurrently, we have a polar icebreaker that embarks on a research expedition to the Arctic 
And um, basically it's, it happens just when the comet is spotted and the changes to the environment that the crew witnesses, um, they have it, its own ticking doomsday clock, just not one um, as loud perhaps as an extinction class comet. So handing off to you, Angie. Thanks, Claire. All right, uh, so I'm Angie Hoffman and I'm the author of Shift. Uh, so a little bit about Shift, it is a romantic comedy and it follows an ambitious workaholic marketing manager who works for an adventure cruise line. And she is up for the promotion of her dreams, but so is her nemesis, the remotely working social media manager. And although they've never met in person, their email battles are the stuff of office legend. Uh, so to decide the promotion, their boss sends them both on a company cruise down to the Galapagos Islands and tasks them with using the experience to come up with a marketing proposal uh, to boost sales in the region. Bass proposal wins the promotion. So when she gets down there and she meets her nemesis for the first time, she makes a shocking discovery. Maybe he's not as vile as she thought. So as she's having uh, island adventures, she's exploring the Galapagos, encountering wildlife. She's getting to know him better. There's this growing attraction there. She starts to ask herself, well, what's the point of working all the time if you never actually live? That's awesome. Thank you. I love how different all of our stories are and that they're in really different settings too. Um, you know, from the Galapagos to, and Claire, you have a couple different settings in your book. Um, and I like that we're all of our books are very engaged in the specific ecosystems that, the, that where we chose to set our books. So I thought maybe we could start Claire, um, like how, how do you see the settings in the effort relevant um, to climate change and habitat destruction specific to the places you chose to write about? Sure. So my, my book does have multiple settings. Um, it is uh, an international ensemble cast, but there are two major settings that characters return, return to, um, and that is the Arctic and the Amazon, uh, which are, in my mind, the battlegrounds for climate change, uh, and also the last wild places on Earth, really, that we stand to lose. Um, so, so with the Arctic, um, we have US Coast Guard Cutter Healy, um, which is a polar icebreaker. It's actually, it's an actual research ship um, that goes on these expeditions. And uh, so the crew witnesses the loss of ice, uh, which is well documented with satellite imagery. Um, and, you know, that's a running theme throughout, throughout that storyline. Uh, like you'll have walruses fighting for space on anemic ice flows because uh, there isn't strong enough ice to support their weight for them to rest on. Um, and even before the ship embarks, even while they're in harbor, uh, thousands of mers, which is a kind of bird that looks like a penguin, wash up ashore dead um, while they're harbored uh, in Alaska. And I wrote that into the story after I read that 62,000 mers, uh, dead or dying, washed up on the shores of the, the Northern Pacific um, in the spring of 2015 to the summer of 2016. That's around the time I started the manuscript. And they, they figured if 62,000 washed up ashore, that was probably probably 1 million perish out in open water in, in a little more than a year. And that was due to uh, the, the most powerful heat wave on record. Um, so, so then that's the Arctic. And then you have the Amazon where my space mission takes place to save the planet. Um, and that's, that's termed uh, the defense effort of Comet UD3. And that takes place in a, a real spaceport run by the European Union in French Guiana uh, in the, on the South American equator. And that plot becomes relevant to the Amazon forest, which is due south. Um, I think I read a stat while I was doing my research that 92,000 square miles of virgin forest was destroyed in, a, in about 10 years, I think like 2016 to 2007, you know, 2006 to 2017. And that's, that's on scale of uh, New York, Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, New Hampshire and Vermont combined, destroyed. Um, there's so much burning that the astronauts on the International Space Station 
can see the fires at night on the Amazon. Um, and I actually wrote that into my story. So you, you see that like the settings and their decline are, are just became the story itself. So the story of saving the planet from, from many different threats happening uh, with many different time frames and uh, immediacy. My goodness, that is, I'm blown away. Um, <laughs> just because, I mean, it's, you have this, such this exciting sci-fi story and it sounds like, you know, there's, there's different things going on, but it's rooted in things that are actually happening here. You know, things that we've seen on the news or we've seen in person. If um, For anybody who's ever uh, seen a glacier in person and you can see where it's retreated, you know, all this, yeah, like you said, it's very well documented and, um, you know, the ice melting in the Arctic. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's incredible. So in, in the effort, um, for, in terms of your characters, which of your characters are most affected um, mm -hmm. by, by you know, these different environmental declines? So I have a character that is affected by, by both the Arctic and the Amazon. And how I set that up is that, um, so, so the polar icebreaker, US Coast Guard Cutter Healy, uh, every expedition, they have a couple guest slots reserved for um, either artists or indigenous guides. And so I had that, I had a guest um, who was a, an activist poet, uh, Nobel laureate named G Gustavo Wyapi. And Gustavo was just a name, a Portuguese name given by a missionary, but Wayapi uh, is his tribe. And the Wayapi peoples are currently living in Amapa, Brazil on land reserves. Um, and uh, the Wayapi are some of, some of the last um, tribes to live uncontacted in, in the deep forest. I think the, the first time they were contacted by the outside world was in the 1970s. Um, I had to, I read a book by an anthropological linguist so I could understand um, how a peoples could survive uh, this hostile environment because the Amazon and the Arctic are so hostile to human habitation, but that's what honestly has allowed them to exist for this long is that they, they are so difficult to survive in. Um, so, so yeah, so, uh, and I, I believe that indigenous peoples surviving off of river water and um, subsistence farming and hunting um, are, are the ones that are most vulnerable to ecological collapse and uh, pollution. Uh, in fact, as I was writing the manuscript, the YAP popped up in the mainstream news for the first time ever, as far as I could tell. Um, I, I, they popped up in the Guardian. Uh, basically, Brazil's presidents, uh, first Temer and then Bolsonaro, tried to remove the protection on half of their land reserve to open it up to mineral mining. Uh, and so they were fighting, and, and their, their forest is, is their survival. Without it, they, they don't live with modern civilization and currency. Uh, they, they are self-sufficient. Um, and, and so as this happened, in fact, Bolsonaro is quoted as saying, where there's indigenous land, there is wealth underneath it. So, so the YAP were fighting a very real fight that came to the front as I was writing the story. It was uh, really surreal. And I, I thought that my character Gustavo could, put, could bring their plight um, to attention of, of people um, because it's interesting that I was dealing with extinction in both of my, um, my missions. And, and for, for most of the world, extinction, like humanity, extinction was a new concept, but for many indigenous peoples, um, extinction and, and being wiped away was, is not a new concept. So, um, so yeah, I was, I was lucky to kind of create a character that had both of these environments and, and was affected by both of them and I could bring the reader in. So, so Angie, uh, I can, I can uh, volley it back to you with, with environments. Um, your book, your romantic comedy called Shipped uh, takes place mostly in the Galapagos Islands. Um, and I've, I've mentioned some challenges with my settings. What are the environmental challenges that the islands are facing today? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, um, you know, for anybody tuning in, if you're not familiar with the Galapagos, uh, the Galapagos Islands, they're an archipelago, a string of islands located 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador, so off the western coast of South America in the Pacific Ocean. So they're very, very remote. Um, and you probably folks probably remember from biology class learning about Charles Darwin sailing there on the HMS Beagle and going island to island and observing the finches and how their different beak sizes are suited to their different food sources and coming up with a series of natural selection um, and also giant tortoises, you know, of course. Um, so the Galapagos Islands, um, they, they are so remote that the wildlife there uh, evolved largely free of predators and completely free of people. People didn't arrive until the islands until 1535. And you know, early sailors to the islands uh, didn't have any concept of <laughs> sustainable use of resources. Uh, and um, they hunted the giant tortoises to near extinction. Uh, as more and more people came to the islands, um, invasive species were brought inadvertently you know, on the ships. And that, that does remain a struggle today in terms of biosecurity. Um, because the, the native wildlife there, uh, the, the plants and the animals, they're not used to competing. So when these these other species come in, and it could be as small as a fly, it could be uh, it could be a plant like blackberry. All it takes is a seed, you know, getting on the island. Um, the the native wildlife and plant life can't compete. Um, so you know, it's you know, th this event's all about climate change. And of course, um, climate change is due to human action. You know, we all we all know that. And in the Galapagos, uh, I think that some of the environmental challenges there. Um, you know, of course, climate change affects everywhere, but uh, certainly in the Galapagos, the challenges that are being faced there are due to human action. Um, but, I, you know, and, and I'll, I'll talk about, I can talk about a little bit later on the flip side. It's also, I mean, the Galapagos is such a fascinating place too, just because, you know, it's, uh, it's had its hardships over many years, you know, and, and um, with native species going extinct, um, you know, invasive species causing so many problems. Uh, but the people there, you know, over the last 50 years or so um, have really come together and made conservation a priority. So it's also, I think, a beautiful story of hope of what, look what can happen, you know, when we, when we choose to, to take, uh, make the right choices and to take positive action. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I think with any environment that's, um, you know, very isolated, not used to competition, um, you know, invasive species definitely can be a problem. I love that you bring up hope because I think that that's something in, in different ways all of our books incorporate. And I think that's uh, something powerful that a lot of people are doing with fiction that engages climate science because there's a lot of gloom and doom if you want to focus on that. But there's so much hope and so many good projects and good people and scientists that are working on amazing projects. So I love that you brought up hope. Um, and I'm and I'm curious, like when, when you were writing, um, you know, a romantic comedy, you know, when what made you decide to incorporate environmental themes in a romance novel? Because that's not something I'm seeing a lot of. And when I found out about your book, I was so excited about it because it's it's not something I expected. And um, what do you hope readers are going to take away from your book? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the reason I decided to set my romance novel in Galapagos, um, I mean, I can I can share a little story of when I first sat down and I was wanting to try my hand at writing and enemies to lovers office romance. Um, I had recently read, this was back in 2018, I'd recently read The Hating Game by Sally Thorne and Dating You, Hating You by Christina Lauren, both uh, uh, enemies to lovers office romances. And I absolutely love those tropes. And I, I said to myself, well, I, I would like to write a romantic comedy. I think I want to try my hand at, at this kind of story, but you know, how can I make it different? How can I make it uh, something that, that speaks to me that's very meaningful to me? And two years before then, back in 2016, I, I had the amazing good fortune to travel uh, to the Galapagos Islands. Um, I traveled aboard um, a small ship expedition um, with Lindblad Expeditions and National Geographic. I was there for a week. Um, and my background is in ecotourism. So as part of my day job, I also work in conservation. Um, and so I was familiar you know, with, with the environmental challenges of the islands. And, and I was already familiar with the wildlife, but I was completely unprepared for what a transformative experience it was to actually go there in person and to have all of these up close and personal encounters with wildlife and just have this feeling of, you know, biological smallness in terms of, you know, you're hiking through a seabird colony on an island like Espanola Island and there's hundreds, thousands of seabirds, there's, there's waved albatross, you know, flying uh, above and Nazca boobies and blue-footed boobies nesting on the rocks and, 
And you think, wow, you know, these birds have been nesting here for countless millennium. And, and who am I, you know, who are we uh, to intrude on this beautiful, you know, natural space? And, you know, with luck, hopefully those seabirds will still be nesting there long after humans are gone, you know, barring disaster. Um, but yeah, so that, I mean, it really had just such a tremendous impact on me. And, and it made me feel connected to nature in a way that I don't think I'd ever felt before. Because uh, the wildlife there, they're not afraid of you, you know, so you can actually get, you know, fairly close. You actually have to watch your step, you know, when you're hiking through seabirds because the, you know, blue food booby will just look up at you like, oh, you're very strange looking. Hello. Um, so, you know, you got to give them their distance. Um, but yeah, so when I getting back to writing shipped, I thought, well, you know, why don't I set this book, this office, enemies to lovers office from it somewhere that had such a tremendous impact on me. And, um, you know, as a, as a bonus, then I could bring in some of these, you know, conservation issues that are very near and dear to my heart. Um, and no spoilers, you know, I don't want to give away what happens <laughs> in the book, but conservation um, does come into play. And it, you know, uh, my, my main character, Henley, had sort of a, a similar experience that I did, you know, her on the page, me in real life with, you um, be feeling impacted, you know, by the Galapagos and feeling like, well, maybe there's something I can do, you know, to help. That's awesome. I, I had the good fortune of going to the Galapagos with my family several years ago too. And I, I felt it a lot. It had a, it had a big impact on my kids. Um, you know, they still talk about it. it's been years, but um, yeah, it's a beautiful place. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. They say, there's a saying that um, you, uh, was it you leave the Galapagos, but the Galapagos never really leaves you. So I love that. So um, yeah, so Julie, yeah, over to you. So most people probably don't think of New Hampshire as the epicenter of the climate crisis. So why did you choose this particular setting for your book? Well, I actually, I think the fact that people don't think about it as the front lines of climate change, it makes it the perfect place to set the story. Um, for one thing, it was easy for me to write this because I own and operate a farm in New Hampshire and I was building my farm from scratch. It had um, been a piece of land that had been um, a forest that was on the market for timber and development. And so we bought it because it was close to our family home. We would have deer and moose and bear that would walk into our yard from this forest and they were going to clear cut it and it was pretty devastating. Um, so we bought the land and the area that had already been clear cut, we built a, a forest on it. So for me, the setting made sense. It was something I was intimately connected with as I was building my farm. I was literally like hauling granite stones around digging in the dirt. So like the land was under my fingernails and, you know, in my hair. And it was part of me while I was writing. I was working on the farm in the day and writing at night. And as I was doing my research, uh, for my farm, for the, you know, the agricultural research and forestry research, because I preserved 92 acres of the forest that surrounds my farm. So I had a lot of work to do. And all those things started bubbling up into my story. They didn't start out in my story. It's really kind of a murder mystery. It's a coming of age story and a murder mystery about two friends that when their children cover up um, a crime for reasons that make sense when they're 11. But it, it, then they have to live with the consequences. And so they return home as adults. So I wanted these women, when they return home as adults to see New Hampshire differently. And so New Hampshire, like you said, it's not, you know, we're not having these devastating hurricanes or forest fires or floods and droughts in the, in the magnitude a lot of places are. So people don't think about it. But I came across this little nugget of information that just like, it changed everything about the way I saw the, my agricultural region that over the past 100 years in New Hampshire, the average summer temperature has gone up by four degrees, which is very disproportionate to most of the country. And, but nobody's running around in New Hampshire screaming climate disaster or, you know, they, they don't see it because it's been a slow burning incremental change. And so my character, she returns home after decades being away. So she sees diff changes. And you know, when you're in a setting, and it's changing slowly, you don't see the changes. Like you don't see your children grow overnight. You know, you, but when you come back after decades, it's there. And so what I wanted to look at all the different ways this slow burning rise in temperature in a place that we don't think of as the front lines of climate change. Like how, what does that mean for this community? And so for me, I said in an agricultural town, which made sense because I'm a farmer. And um, I found that the growing season in my region over that same hundred years has been extended by 22 days. 
So that means like I have three weeks longer of a growing season than they did a century ago. And that makes an impact on what grows and what species no longer find the woods of New Hampshire hospitable and invasive species that move in. And it, it, so it changes an ecosystem and it changes the town and the people. And the thing that I, I, people always find the most shocking is the sugar maples. You know, we have those iconic, beautiful sugar maples that like light up the forest with colors in the fall. If you look at a map of where these trees are, um, it's, they're moving north. Over time, my New Hampshire maples might be in Canada. So my main character, she's an entomologist that works for the forestry department. So I have her deep in the woods. She's um, you know, tracking an invasive beetle. She is monitoring the forest and you know, she's very intimately engaged with the woods because that's what I was doing when I wrote the book. So for me, it felt like a lot of discovery about my own land that I was in the process of building. And as I came to understand all these, these challenges that my growing region was facing, it, um, it became really important to me to talk about it and to tell people about it and to see all the, the ways it was changing a community in ways that you don't think of as climate change. You know, it affects firefighters, it affects forestry workers and there's you know, crop failures and having to change what crops you grow. So I, um, I love that no one ever thinks of New Hampshire when they think of climate change, but I wanna say, yes, think of New Hampshire, but think of everywhere else. Because, you know, as much as, you know, I, I think it's happening in New Hampshire, you know, we're not having the day-to-day -day disasters like some places are. And I think that if, if, if we on a day-to-day -day basis aren't feeling the effects of climate change, it's a, I think maybe we should ask ourselves, like, why aren't we feeling it and who is? Because it's happening, you know, the climate apocalypse is already here for a lot of people. Like Claire was saying for, you know, different indigenous communities, you know, the, but the, you know, the climate disasters already arrived. So for me, it was an exploration of getting to know my own land and my own farm. And as I was writing the story, so my farm and my book are kind of like two parts of the same story for me because I created them together. You, uh, great segue, you just mentioned um, the invasive beetle in your, in your book. And you also mentioned that it's getting too hot for sugar maples. Uh, <laughs> You, in your book, you, there are other species, and there's a lot of movement with them, and, and, and those are two examples. Um, there's also the songbird that is, is part of the title, Waiting for the, song, waiting for the Night Song. Um, and there's also uh, a lot of animals like deer and bear fleeing forest fires. And even bringing up the bear, by the way, is that's, I think, one of your most heart-wrenching scenes, and it's, it's hard for me to do. Um, are, are these things actually happening, um, you know, like the songbird and, and the forest fires, are those currently happening in, in New Hampshire? And um, how, how does that really affect, you know, the, the ecology? Yeah, so that's, I, thank you for that. Um, so the, the beetle that is this invasive beetle that my main character, her name's Katie Kessler, she's an entomologist. So she's tracking this beetle and trying to prove that it has moved into New Hampshire and threatening the forest. Now, this is a very real beetle. And you've probably heard about it indirectly. It's the same beetle that has been killing off forests in California and Colorado and other parts of the West. They, they move in during a drought and then they cut off the resin flow in a tree and they basically starve these already weak trees. And, and then they kill them and then they move on to the next tree. And then when forest fires come, it's just kindling in the forest, ripe for a forest fire. Now they do not exist in New Hampshire. I use some fictional license because I wanted my character to be trying to prove something. And if they already existed, she wouldn't have anything to prove. But I had to do a lot of research about what conditions would bring this beetle to New Hampshire and could it actually happen and how would it happen? So the science behind it is real, but the beetle itself isn't there yet. But the songbird um, in the title of the book you mentioned, um, it's called the Bicknell's Thrush, which is very real and very much threatened in New Hampshire. And it's really, I, this is one of my favorite uh, items I came upon when I was researching. So the Bicknell's thrush is this little tiny bird. I mean, it would fit right in the palm of your hand. It's gray, very nondescript. It's not a bird that's gonna catch your eye or you know, you're not, it's not the most beautiful bird, but um, it has a role in the ecosystem. So this bird migrates uh, south to the Caribbean in the winter and its habitat is being destroyed in the Caribbean. It's by hurricanes and deforestation. So every year they go south their habitat is shrinking and they die. And so they're coming back to uh, New England in smaller numbers every year. And it's 
they're also struggling in New Hampshire because our temperature is rising and our ecosystem is shifting. So they're having this struggle on both ends. And for me, it was like this shocking realization that climate change in another part of the world is affecting my woods. You know, a hurricane in the Caribbean is affecting what's happening in the forest behind my house. And this little tiny bird, um, it has, you know, it's, it's one of, you know, many members of an ecosystem and when something disappears, you know, something shifts and something else has to take its place. And this little bird has this role that it plays in helping a forest rebuild after a forest fire. And so it plays this important, you know, kind of um, in regenerating forests, it has a role. So when these animals are gone, even this little teeny tiny gray bird that might just, you know, it's just this little bird, when it's gone, the, the nature and the character of a, of a, a land shift. And I use it, my, my character Katie, when she returns home and she has to face the consequences of this crime she covered up as a child, she is missing this bird, the songbird. And that's why the, I, it's in the title that she's waiting for the night song. As a child, she would hear this bird sing and it meant something to her. And it was a memory with her and her father. And when she comes back as an adult, it's not there. And it's not extinct, this bird's not gone. And it's for me, a little vehicle of hope. Like it's not gone. Like we can still, you know, we can save the Bicknell's thrush. And so for me, the um, the songbird and the beetle, they're not the two, you know, you asked about the bear and the deer. Those are the animals we see. They're the ones we think about. And, you know, you if you see one hit on the side of the road, it's devastating. But every time you see a deer on the side of the road, like there's like thousands, hundreds of thousands of these birds that we're losing. And so for me, all of them together, you know, there it's like we're all in flux, you know, and the humans too, because people have asked me about the beetles, like are, you know, she's fighting the beetles, the beetles are the villain because they're moving in and killing the forest. And I don't feel that way at all about the beetle. I feel like the beetle just, you know, wants to raise its family and find a nice place to live. And this is a hospitable place and this is a great place to, you know, set up my, you know, raise a family in this tree. And so it's like what we're all doing. We all just want to find a place to exist in this world and all the pieces are moving. And so in, in Waiting for the Night Song, my main character, Katie, is also herself trying to find her place, you know, and, and does she still belong in this hometown she left a long time ago? And what does it mean if the bird leaves? And um, how is her hometown changing because of climate change? So it's, it's a metaphor, but it's also very much what is happening. Um, in, in New Hampshire in the forest. And, and I think you, know, you can extrapolate that to pretty much any community. You're gonna find changes, even if they're really quiet and subtle. No, it's true. But, but uh, as you said, you know, there is hope and there, there is action, uh, which I, th I think a lot of us, that's why we kind of added these elements to our stories is we're, we're hoping to inspire action um, and we can save the, the Bicknell's thrush. Um, and in fact, our sponsor, we can save the coral, you know, the Coral, found, the coral Restoration Foundation. Um, and that's, that's the hope aspect is that there's always what we can do when we're done reading the book, what, you know, what, what is out there. Yeah, I, I love talking about hope in the context of these stories because I read a lot of novels that have climate themes in them and not, not all are actively hopeful. Some, some are hard, you know, and there's hard truths out there, you know, you can't sugarcoat it, but, but I feel like if we don't have hope, like, what are we fighting for? And, and I think you can, you know, you don't have to have a, um, a nice, neat, happy ending where everything's great, but you can have a reason to fight on. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think that, you know, both of your books have, you know, there's things that are threatened and, you know, but there's like hope, you know, your characters have the ability to see a future with it, I think is really important. Definitely. Yeah, there's so much we stand to lose. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was definitely something um, that was so uh, revelatory for me, just in general in life and, and going to Galapagos is this whole notion that, you know, people cause a lot of problems in the world, yeah. right? Like some of the biggest ones I would say that they're, they're totally all our fault, but then the, yeah, the hopeful thing is that people can also be the solution to those problems. And, you know, I think sometimes it, it feels um, overwhelming to, to think about the scale and the scope of these climate problems. But, um, you know, something, something for me uh, that I wanted to get across and shipped um, in, in, in subtle ways is that everybody can make a positive difference. Anybody can make a positive difference. You know, you don't, have to go out and, and, you know, do some earth shattering thing or, you know, start a nonprofit or whatever. 
it's like, oh my goodness, well, you can, um, you can recycle, you can drive a little bit less, you can, you can phase out single use plastics, you know, and go for the, you know, reusable straws. <laughs> it, nice. It's, you know, I like to think about how all of the, if everybody took just a few little actions, made some little changes to start with, you know, baby steps, uh, I think that can make such a big difference. Um, so, and it's just, yeah, giving people a reason to like, okay, it, well, yeah, things can change if we choose, if we choose to change. And I, and I think that, you know, people tend to think that you are, you know, activism looks a certain way, you know, being marching or living off grid or, you know, being vegan, or they're all things that are, you know, make a, have a tremendous impact, but it, it doesn't always have to look like that. And I think that we all have, and I mean, just looking at us, we have three very different careers. But that you can, whatever your career is, you you can choose to find find things within your career that make that matter. That you can make small changes, even you know, in, in finance, you in any career, there are ways to impact decisions that affect the climate. So I think that is um, you know one of the things I've really enjoyed about reading climate novels. And I think something else that uh, you know we you know we th a lot of books talk about climate change as this thing that's coming like this future event that's looming out in front of us, but it's, yeah, it's here and, and it's right here. And I think that, you know, it's also really important to, you know, acknowledge that like I, right now I have water and I have security and I have food um, today. So is climate change affecting me today? I could say no, but you can also, I, you have to acknowledge that there are people who are being affected and it's generally, you know, more vulnerable people. It's, you know, black, brown, indigenous communities, poor communities who don't have resources. And, it, you know, n recognizing that if something's not affecting us today, doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just not in, in our yard yet. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not here. And I, th I think that there's a lot of amazing writers that are writing climate that are bringing really important voices and stories into, and I, I think, and maybe I'm, I might be biased here because I read widely in climate, um, fiction, but I think it's a, a incredibly diverse list of authors that are um, that are bringing a lot of in, there's a lot of indigenous writers, especially in the YA community, and a lot of black authors and like Latinx and uh, Southeast Asian writers that are just um, bringing these incredible stories that I think are, it makes sense maybe because a lot of these communities are being affected first and their their stories are really vibrant. So I I love that we're able to have this conversation while this is emerging as a you know, and that we're able to be here to talk about it. Are you, do you guys have any um, like favorite books or, you know, books you're interested in reading in this category right now? The one right to your, right next to your shoulder. My book. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, and you, you got me to read it and it was. It, it is it's such a good one. Yeah. I, just, if, if you can't, if you can't tell what that is, that is a Migrations by Charlotte McConaughey, which is maybe my favorite book in this category. It's a near future story that in um, where most animals, I think the first lines of the book, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it's something like the animals are dying soon. We'll all be here alone, which yes. sounds really dark. Haunting. It's haunting, but it, it ends hopeful. Don't you think? I mean, it's a hard story, but it it's, it's makes me like, love this earth you know at the end of the story like i just want to save everything um she, she, she continues the fight yeah and also i should remind everybody that if you have any questions you can drop them into the q a box while we're talking and we're going to try to um get to those in a few minutes but yeah please fr feel free to throw out any questions in there i mentioned it looks like we we do have a question already oh okay so um, do, we want, do we want to hop to the question or claire i'm well, sorry did i cut you off oh i just wanted to give a quick anecdote and also yeah. Uh, how the three of us met um, is that for, I think we first met on a Facebook group for new authors because all three of us debuted in January um, and we're also uh, all of us are now on the uh, the climate writers um, league which is very exciting but um, in, the, in the Facebook group I remember Julie um, giving a post about how she went to meet her publisher for the first time and she brought them jam <laughs> was it jam? It was like peach, yeah, peach jam, jam from, from I grew. her farm. So she had made jam from from she grew the peaches and then cooked. So not even I'm, you know, I'm like cooking. There's not even cooking. It's cooking and growing, and brought them in jars to her publishing team. And I I was like I need to meet this person. <laughs> I was just so taken by that. So 
and yes, I just it's been a it's been a fabulous group, and I got to, I got to meet both of both of you as as climate authors. So it's been it's been wonderful. Yeah, I think we're really lucky. I mean, the pandemic's made it pretty hard to be a debut author. Yes. Uh, we haven't had the in person events and you know any travel or anything like that, but the online the camaraderie within our debut group has been um, like you know just so affirming and, and a place to share our stories and share best practices and the bookstores that have and librarians that have you know lifted us up has been you know there's been a lot of silver linings definitely how's it been for you angie have you um been able to do anything in person yet or are you doing mm -hmm. online stuff no nope so yeah i've just been doing uh doing a lot of virtual events and um but it, yeah, it's been great. I mean, just to connect with so many people from different places and um, yeah, not be limited to geography. So definite silver lining. That's awesome. So, um, you know, I, I, I know Emily was going to pop in with some questions. I don't know if, if you want to rejoin us, Emily. I know you had some questions you wanted to ask us and maybe some audience questions. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it's been just a pleasure getting to sit here and listen to you guys. <laughs> it's been so fun. Um, and there's, you know, I was bragging to the authors before <laughs> that I read all the books and it was so exciting because it's not all genres that I would typically read and I don't know why. Um, and hearing it all weave together has just been really nice. So I'm hoping, I think our audience is probably in the same boat, but I wanted to say that out loud for them. We do have some questions from the audience, so I'll start with them. Um, Heather writes, what advice, and this is great, just talking about you know, your time writing and being debuts, uh, what advice do you have for weaving the climate change theme into a story without being didactic about the lessons we've learned? So that's for all of you. Okay. Um, <laughs> you want to try that one, Claire? Um, yes, it's it's true. Uh, and I remember listening to an NPR radio station, and they were saying that um, the number, like one of the biggest topics that makes people change the channel, is the environment. And I, I think people sometimes don't they don't want to be lectured to, and it's it's sometimes they only think of facts, but. Um, I, I think one way is to bring in, as I mentioned, um, the human story, and we, we mentioned the people that are people that are affected, um, to, to make it to make you the reader empathize with what is happening, um, and, and you know it, it is more easy to put yourself in someone else's shoes if if you can kind of understand them, um, but yeah, don't don't be preachy. Um, try to you know the famous um, statement, uh, show don't tell. Um, and, and make a person feel and see rather than, you know, stats kinds of kinds of things. Uh, how about you, Julie? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And in, in my um, in my book, I have scientists that don't agree about some of the science in it. And I think that's important because and it's not that they're necessarily anybody's a de climate denialist. They're just looking at real science and looking for solutions. and. And it's a conversation that's going on. So there isn't like one answer and everybody else is wrong. It's kind of like taking in all the information, looking at possible solutions. And then there are people in my story who question climate change, if it's actually real. And I think it would be really easy to paint people like this with, um, you know, like rough brush strokes and, you know, like a stereotype. But I tried really hard that the people who were questioning in my story, because, you know, there are a lot of people who do that if we disregard them as readers or as characters, you know, we're not, we're not helping anything with the conversation, you know, we're not furthering the conversation or bringing other people into the conversation. So I agree that being didactic is not a good tool if you want the readers to enjoy your story. I think it's always about story. It's always characters and plot first, because if they don't read the story, if they don't want to turn the page, it doesn't matter how brilliant your ideas are. You know, they need the story. So I feel like everything, I'm, I'm right now I'm working on another book that also has climate themes in it. And my my editor had to have a little sit down with me and kind of say, let's, let's you know, dial this, this part back. I see what you're thinking, but she was right. Like you can't push ideas, but it's the, like Claire said, like the emotions. What do you think, Angie? I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, I love, uh, Claire, you said, you know, make them feel. Um, you know, and, and for me, writing romance, um, a lot of people are like, wait, what? You, you also have environmental themes in your romance. Like you wouldn't really necessarily expect that, but 
uh, I mean, the great thing about romance is, you know, it's character driven. You know, so I, I try to bring my readers uh, very deeply into my to my characters' heads and their points of view and have them experience what they're experiencing as they're experiencing it. So, um, you know, bringing the reader in on the ground, making them care through your characters, you know, in an organic way, making them fall in love with the environment or, you know, have these extraordinary experiences. And maybe you never even utter the words climate change, but bringing them in, making them feel, and then in, in uh, a natural way, you know, through, uh, you know, through conflict, through character development, then bring those issues out. Because, I mean, people, I mean, characters are people, right? And people care about lots of different things. And, you know, we all care about the environment, we care about climate. So I, I definitely think um, there's a way to do that very organically and subtly without being preachy, which yeah. is exactly like what you guys said. <laughs> yeah, I, no one uh, wants to be preached to. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I was with another author on a panel recently and I'm, I don't remember who he was quoting, but it was talking, it was also talking about, you know, the environment and, and writing about nature and how, that your job is to it, more to make the make the um, reader care about the environment or or like nature. I don't mean the environment as a in a political sense, but to care about nature and to love this world. And if you love this world, you want to protect it. So you don't need to be preachy. Just show them the world that you love, and then that may you know maybe that will stir them to want to protect it. And Julie's next book is called The Last Beekeeper. Just enough. <laughs> everyone, everyone needs to like put it to, on their TBR. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a, it's a ways out. There's coming on early 2023, but it's a um. I, I seem to have a thing about insects. The first book kind of centered on an invasive beetle, and the next one, I'm I am a beekeeper, so I am in love with bees and beekeeping culture and the, just the smells and everything about it. So I'm really excited. I'm, I'm, in, I'm writing it right now and I'm in that honeymoon phase where everything's awesome. Like I'm just loving it. I, it's not always that way as you both know, but right now I'm very excited about my bees right now. Oh, fantastic. It's a great feeling. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this next question is for Claire. Um, although I actually think it, probably applies to all of you, um, but Claire specifically, one of the beautiful things, uh, Christina says, one of the beautiful things about your book is how the individual stories blend into different types of relationships. Was there one that you were more excited to write about or really excited to write about? So the, was there a certain character that I enjoyed the most? Or storyline, mm -hmm. I kind of have a, different storylines all on this, you know, yeah. all experiencing this global thing. But. Yes, yes. Um, I, I think probably I had two that were just very exciting. Um, one, one took place in um, between a character named Rivka and, and Lamar, who were, um, they were just uh, like apartment mates and who, who had a, a nice like rapport. And then through a cataclysmic event and, um, just with with uh, society kind of breaking down, they found that they needed each other and reached out. And I feel like we do that as people. We need other people, even even though it's scary and dangerous. We need people, and so they kind of reach out. And it's com completely platonic friendship. Um, they help each other sur survive at least to the next chapter. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they um, they 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 need to cross the Harlem River to to get into Manhattan they need to leave Queens uh because Queens is it's just become it's kind of fallen to chaos and so I just love the idea of you know people that liked each other but just become become I guess found family is one of those tropes that um I guess outsiders like me have always really enjoyed um I, I also had a love story and and that was I liked that even even in an apocalyptic event people still fall in love just like in a pandemic People still fell in love, had children, got married, um, you know, wrote books. <laughs> so uh, there was a love story between two people on the polar icebreaker, and uh, and they they um, they fall in love and in, in, and probably wouldn't have without that circumstance. So it was again silver linings that were created, and they're they're always there. There's always hope, and there's always people coming together. And I'd love to open up that question, though, to, to Julie and Angie as well. 
Yeah, my um, in my book, the the central relationship in the book is between two women that are friends from childhood that um, like I had mentioned, they cover up a crime when they're children, and have to live with the ramifications of this decision, and the weight of it is so much that it just splits them apart. Like they can't bear the weight of the secret that they share, and they are driven apart, um, and they come back together as adults. But what I love about the relationship of these two women is. Um, it, the friendship when they were little girls, they were little girls who were playing in the woods, you know, out in the lake, jumping off of rocks and, you know, um, hugging trees and nature was so important to them. And that's where they built their relationship. And it was really based on a very real friendship I had. Um, as I was writing those two little girls, I was, I was writing myself and my best friend as, as, as children and the creating, like imagining the what ifs, just to be clear, we never covered up a crime in the woods, my friend and I, but we, you know, we had this, uh, the dynamic of a relationship that was so foundational to me that even it was, she and I also drifted apart. We didn't have a falling out, but we, we separated as we went our separate ways. I never saw her again after high school. And um, when I was writing the book, I was so engaged in this reliving this relationship we had as children because it was so special. And um, it, I think it laid a lot of foundation about how I formed friendships later in life as well, that I found myself thinking about her so much that I found her. And like the two characters in my book, Katie and Daniela, who come back together as an adult, as adults to face up to this um, this crime that they covered up as children. We did not have to face a crime, but we found each other again as adults in the same way my characters did. So I felt like in the first, my story is told in two timelines of the little girl story and the adult story. And in the little girl story, I felt like I was reliving my childhood with my friend, Stephanie, when I was writing it. But in the adult timeline, I wrote it first and then I went back and found my friend and relived it the way my character did, which was um, really special for me because I felt like I was like almost part of the story in a lot of ways. How about you, Angie? Um, well, um, so I mean, I wrote a romance, right? So I guess I could say that my favorite relationship was <laughs> the romance. We uh, love the romance. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, and my main character also, um, there's a strong sister relationship in the book as well as female friendships. And I love writing about um, you know, strong empowered women and exploring um, relationships between between women, you know, friendships. So uh, th those were fun to write as well, but yeah, the romance, gotta love the romance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I'm, the next question is for you, Angie, but I'm gonna just piggyback on what you just said because um, I think when, when somebody writes a book and their characters are really great and they stick with you people always ask would you ever write these characters again and like another one and I know authors probably don't like that because <laughs> you want to write something new but I was really like would really love to see a book from Walsh from her sister and so, um not to put you on the spot you don't have to make any promises okay. but <laughs> um we do have another question asking where uh is another location you'd like to write about but also would you ever write about uh, any of the characters or and Walsh in particular for me well thank you you're you're not the first person who's asked me that so it's totally <laughs> fine <laughs> get that question a lot um so when I wrote Shipped you know where I finished writing Shipped I definitely felt like there was more to Walsh you know the sister I mean, and I, I low-key love her I mean I love writing women who are just a hot mess you know <laughs> she's still trying to figure out her life and um, you know, and I, well, I don't want to give any spoilers for anybody um, who hasn't read it, but where she would end up next, I think would be pretty interesting. Um, so uh, I, I'm not working on a sequel right now. Um, and I don't have any immediate plans, but never say never because uh, I do love her. So we'll, we shall see. Um, and then, oh, the second, the second question about, is there another location you'd like to write about next? Uh, so I am working on my my next book right now. It's called Dream On. It's coming out from Gallery Books, Simon & Schuster uh, next summer, so summer 2022. And that one takes place a lot closer to home. It takes place in Cleveland. <laughs> so not as exciting as the Galapagos. Um, but then after that, I, I am kicking around uh, a story idea uh, and I would love to set a book in on South Georgia Island. It's a sub-Antarctic island, uh, just, um, it's like a few days by boat off the east coast or the the southern tip of South America, just right right above Antarctica there. But um, I think it has the largest colony of um, king penguins. They they go there to breed. Um, 
And it's another place that I've had the, the amazing good fortune to travel to. And it was also just a really, really incredible experience. Um, and I think that'd be really fun to set a book there. Uh, maybe like a fish out of water sort of story, I think would be fun. Bring somebody into this sort of harsh sub-Antarctic environment. Um, but there, there's definitely evidence of you know, climate change going on in the Southern Ocean. I mean, even just last year, I read a study about how scientists have discovered microplastics in sea ice around Antarctica for the first time. And previously they thought that the currents in the Southern Ocean were too strong and it kind of kept the, the microplastics out, but that's, that's not happening. Um, in plastic pollution in general, you know, you hear about baby albatross, you know, winding up dead. And then when scientists cut them open, they're just, just exploding with plastic. It's horrible. So, um, but I would like to, you know, if I could work that in, in a rom-com in this, in this unique setting that's cooking in the back of my brain. So maybe one day. That'd be nice to research too. Again, I've, I've seen mm -hmm. photos of people on social, like with a penguin. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the penguins are so fun. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah, I've had some people ask me about the, um, if I would ever write another book featuring Katie, my entomologist. And I won't say no, I don't have plans for it, but um, I, I will say that when I was doing the research for the book, I got really engaged with entomology Twitter, which is a shockingly fascinating little corner of the internet that, um, that there is so much exciting work going on that I found like 20 story ideas of just based on insects that are doing crazy things. And, um, and there's, so I, I did have a moment where I was like, wow, maybe she's just, there's another book, not another bug. I don't know why I'm obsessed with bugs. I never would have thought I would be an insect person, but, um, I am not, I had the new book is not, has none of the same characters, different setting. And I actually have a third book that is, I'm, I'm outlining at the moment. It's not in, it's not been sold. It's, but it's also not with these characters, but I, I, I don't know. There's something about th that character of Katie Kessler that I, I'm not a hundred percent sure that I'm finished with her because there are so many insects out there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, I just, I had such a, um, I was so incredibly fascinated with, because, you know, insects are so, so, uh, on the front, they are the front line. They're dying off in bigger numbers, birds and insects and, than other creatures because, um, you know, and, and so they sh we should be watching them and we're losing them at a faster rate. And I think that they're, they're telling us something, you know, there's stories, all these insects have stories that we need to listen to. Like with this pine bark beetle in my book, they are, they are telling us something when it, why they're in the forest and what it means and you know what can happen so I think that, I think there could be a whole lot of other books um featuring Katie and a and another insect but I'm not I'm not sure that it'll happen maybe just in my mind okay and how about you Claire you kind of created this universe yeah uh, I I would love to to do post-apocalyptic Alaska um with with a with a, a family of three um which I, I won't get too far into for spoilers um yeah, I mean, it would it would be kind of uh, you know what what next for for civilization? Like, what do we want to be? Um, what happens when we kind of come back and say, what are, what do we want to build next? Uh, having having built something before, what what next? That would that would be a blast. I, I'm I'm not writing it now though. Um, I'm actually writing a contemporary thriller at the moment. But, oh, awesome. Yeah, like you said, never, never say never. It's it's always it's it's exciting to kind of revisit. They are almost like old friends. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more, uh, and kind of on that same note, um, this is from Jenny. As a writer crafting books like these, how do you walk the line between remaining contemporary, near future, and something that might feel a little bit too dystopian? Um, or alternatively, how do you lean toward dystopian as a way of engaging readers in climate issues? Um, well, I will say that the new book I'm writing is a little bit in the near future, The Last Beekeeper. And um, I think it, it like, you know, I think Claire had said this earlier, it's always about the characters. You know, that the, the world building is the background of the story. And it's about what the characters do in that world. And so I think there are some books that go really far with their world building and are like beautifully done. Um, but even in those, even in these stories with these elaborate, um, you know, post-apocalyptic worlds, 
that the reason you keep turning the pages and keep reading is because of the people and the, that you're either, you care about them, you're worried about them, you're excited for them, you have to be engaged emotionally in the story. So I think that, um, you know, there's, you can go really far with the world building and dystopic and post-apocalyptic worlds and it can be magnificent, but that always probably isn't the front and center part of the story that people might remember. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's all about investment, <laughs> the character investment. Yeah. Well, this has been really just such a fun opportunity to talk with with all of you, and um, you know, to be with you, Emily. And uh, thank you for hosting us. And I just want to reading our books. <laughs> yes, yeah. Thank you for reading all thank of our you. books. And, and the booksellers, they get so many books through their stores, and they can't possibly read all of them. So it is a real gift to us that you read all of our books. So thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry I bragged about it so much, but I was I, very excited. It's so rare to pick up three books and like all of them. <laughs> so um, thank you for writing the books. Thank you for being with us uh, tonight. Thank you uh, to Coral Restoration Foundation. Their website is in the chat um, and it can also be found on our website when, um, and so please consider learning more about them, donating. They have information on how they can get it. You can get involved in the work they're doing. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you to our wonderful authors. Thank you, Emily. And thank yeah. you, Books and Books. And thank you, Coral Restoration Foundation. It's been a wonderful night. Yeah, we're really grateful. Thank you. It was great spending the evening with you ladies. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Same. And thanks everybody for, uh, for attending. Thanks. Fully in person next time. <laughs> next time. <laughs> All right. Good night. Good night, everyone.